Uh, good morning, everybody who's joined us so far. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're just going to be beginning in a, in a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for some more people to join the session. Uh, we'll just get started in a, in a minute or so. I'll just wait for some, see uh, more people to join. Okay. Okay, great. Well, um, I think we'll get kicking off then. Uh, okay, so good morning, everybody who's joined us so far. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today and welcome to our panel discussion on the topic of uh, achieving sustainable tourism in Spain and Scotland, uh, which is an event held in collaboration between the Spanish Chamber of Commerce in the UK and the Spanish Consulate in Edinburgh, uh, which is the second in our Connecting to Spain uh, joint online event series that we've been carrying out. Um, so. Just in a quick note, uh, after both of our speakers have um, given their presentations today, you will be able to ask any questions that you have to the speakers. Uh, to do so, please either use the, the chat function that you'll see at the bottom of your screen or the Q&A function uh, or the raise hand tool, they all work equally. So um, please do um, get involved with your questions. We'd love to hear from you after both of their presentations. Uh, I'm now gonna hand over to Eduardo Barachina, who will be um, just be opening up the session now. Eduardo is the uh, president of the Spanish Chamber in the UK. Thank you very much, Hannah, and good morning, everyone. Um, so on behalf of the Spanish Chamber of Commerce, I just want to give everyone um, a warm welcome to our first uh, webinar um, following summer, if one, can, if one can actually call summer to what we actually had in England. But um, anyway, the spirit is to bring together uh, two different uh, models of tourism. Spain uh, uh, is a global tourism powerhouse and tourism as a service industry accounts for more than 12% of Spanish GDP. S Scotland is still very important, but accounts for around 6%. Uh, tourism in both, both will acknowledge that tourism uh, um, not only creates a uh, source of wealth and a source of um, uh, prosperity for both economies, but at the same time, it does help in this world to bring people together and create uh, further business opportunities. The Spanish Chamber of Commerce is not physically in Scotland, but we are determined to develop the relationship with the Scottish uh, uh, industry, with the Scottish businessmen, and, and generally with the Scottish institutions. So we are, we are very pleased to, to, you know, to work together with the uh, General Consulate in Edinburgh. So I thank um, Stephen and Oscar for, for contributing today to, to the discussion panel and, and, and Ignacio Cartagena for co-hosting the event. So without further ado, uh, I pass over now on to Ignacio to present the two panelists. And I do hope that uh, attendees today will find this seminar helpful and that in the long, medium long term, it will create opportunities for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo. And uh, thank you, thanks to everyone for, for getting connected and uh, particularly to Hannah for, for, uh, for organizing this, this panel. Um, I would start by a very counterintuitive statement. 
this is a very timely moment for reflecting on tourism. This year, which has been so peculiar and has deprived us from the pleasure of being in a ho good hotel, in a good restaurant, uh, of knowing many other countries, is a very good moment for all of us to reflect together on the value of tourism. Not only uh, as a source of, of economic profits, but also as a way, as a tool for mutual knowledge and mutual understanding. So thank you very much and thanks uh, to uh, both panelists for being here. Uh, just in order to very briefly explain to you the rationale of this panel, why we are organizing this panel. Look, some, some very, very simple figures. Uh, last year in Scotland, um, more than 15 million visitors visited uh, this part of the UK. Uh, tourism creates more than 200,000 direct jobs in Scotland and represents now roughly 8% of Scottish economy. It is a tourism which is based on history, on environment, on the nature. Uh, there are just a very, very small figure. There are more than 3,000 castles and fortresses in Scotland. In Spain, last year, this year has been a very peculiar one, but last year Spain reached 84 million visitors. Tourism in my country creates more than 2 million direct jobs and represents more or less 15% of the Spanish economy. In Spain, we have more than 10,000 castles and fortresses. Only in Castilla y Leon, there are more than 500 castles. Why we have created this panel? Well, because we believe as a consulate that there is a lot of room for interaction between Spanish companies and Scottish companies. In part, and in particular, between those companies that really uh, um, base their business model on uh, things which are not necessarily based on the economic profit, which is the heritage preservation, the commitment with, with the environment, and the creation of an economic motor and, and jobs, in particular in, in remote and unpopulated areas. And this is why we selected two very prominent voices of uh, tourism in Spain and in Scotland. Oscar López, the president and the CEO of Paradores, and Stephen Leakey, who is the chairman of CRIF Hydro, a very well-known uh, uh, hotel chain in Scotland for, for all those who reside here. Uh, I was myself with my family in one of his hotels this, this weekend, and also president of the Scottish uh, Tourism Association, which covers more than 70% of uh, tourism companies in, in Scotland. I will start uh, going through the CV of, uh, of Oscar López. Oscar López is uh, president and CEO of Paradores, he holds a degree in political science with a double speciality in public administration and international relations. He completed a postgraduate course in international economics in the University of Newcastle upon Tyne, a city which also is covered by, by, these, uh, by these general consulates. In uh, 2004, he was elected a uh, member of the Spanish parliament by the uh, Socialist Party. Um, and he, from, from that year onwards, he, he has he held a very uh, important uh, career in the political sphere in my country. In uh, 2015, he was appointed senator on behalf of the Cortes of Castilla y Leon, a position in which he remained until the 2018. He fluently speaks English and French and has taught public communication and debate techniques at the law school of the University of Navarra. He has also been a political analyst and fellow in different radio and television programs in both the public and private channels in, in my country. Uh, and now he is the head of, uh, of Paradores, who really uh, clearly is one of the most uh, prominent brands uh, in, in, in my country and represents not only commitment with uh, tourism, but also with the develop development of, of remote uh, areas in my country and the creation of an economic motor in those uh, areas in which um, 
there is not necessarily any other economic resource. So Oscar, thank you again and you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning everybody. I, first of all, I would like to thank the Council and the, and the Chamber for this opportunity. It is a pleasure for me. As you said, I was studying and living in Newcastle upon Tyne, so I crossed Hadrian's Wall many times, so I know the area, I know Scotland. Here in Spain, we love Scotland. There are thousands of Spaniards every year going to Scotland and living in Scotland. We love Scotland. As the, as the moderator said, uh, I, was, uh, I was born in Castilla Leon, it's uh, the inland of Spain. Uh, so I know very well the reality of Scotland because Castilla Leon, we could say, it is the Scotland of Spain. I mean, <laughs> not only because of the cold and, and the winter and the, and the rain, Spain is, is not only sun and beaches, but also because we are full of castles. Uh, we know very well the rural world, the rural reality, the, the geographical dispersion, the low population, population density, in some, the reality of the rural world. We know it very well. You were talking about Scotland, and it looked to me like if you were talking about Paradores, because we are castles, we are convents, we are historical buildings, we are uh, heritage, we are local food, we are the inland, uh, we are the rural world. So uh, I think this is a, a really, good, uh, really good issue to discuss. And, and I think that Paradores, that it's a single unique experience in the world. We are the only state-owned company in the world uh, dedicated to this, dedicated not, not only to promote tourism, but also to, to keep our heritage, to, to maintain uh, our heritage. So I think it's a good, good experience, as I said before. Let me, let me give you some figures just to understand what Paradores is and what represents uh, there we go. That is not Spain, that is Greece. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought it was open. Okay, let me give you one minute. It's always the same with computers, you know? Okay, there we go. Let me, let me give you, as I said, uh, some figures. Paradores, it's uh, 92 years uh, of history. I mean, it was created in 1928. Uh, it's uh, number one in tourism of uh, cultural tourism and, and nature tourism in Spain. Now we have 97 Paradores in Spain, but uh, also one in Portugal. And, um, and uh, as you see there, it's a 100% state-owned company and it's like 4,500 jobs every year. Um, last year, 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2019, it was more than 258 million euros of uh, incomes. 52% it was uh, in the... In, 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 in the beds, I mean, in the rooms, and 48% it was in, in, in our restaurants. I always say we are a chain of hotels, but also a chain of restaurants. We have 97 hotels and more than 100 restaurants all around Spain. So maybe we are the only chain, the only hotel chain that more or less half of the, of the incomes is because of the restaurant, not, not only uh, of the bedrooms. I mean, um, we have 6,000 uh, 6, 6, 6, uh, rooms in, in the whole of the chain uh, hotels. And uh, last year it was 1.4 million clients, 65% uh, Spanish, Spanish ones, and 35% it was uh, from all around the world. Um, last year also we, we, we sold, uh, it was like 2.2 uh, 2 million, uh, 2 million uh, lunch and dinners and, and, and uh, in the restaurants. And, uh, and last year also we, we had this uh, 39.1 million GOP and five, uh, 15, 15 million of uh, profits finally. We are dedicated to all of this. Uh, normally we preserve our historical heritage. We create a, a quality product uh, for tourism. 
we keep our regional uh, uh, cook, I mean, our regional uh, dishes. We hope, we, we try to keep our, I mean, we are fully committed to, to, the, to the global development uh, goals and uh, sustainable tourism. We are a, 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 an engine to, to develop uh, local places. And uh, as I told you before, we are, we are a state-owned company, but also uh, we, we are a company with profits. So that is a, a good experience, I think. When, when you talk about Paradores, you, you talk about something that has created a destiny. People in Spain, they don't say, they don't say I go this, to this place or to this town. They say, I go to Paradores. And even in, in the UK, everybody, I mean, many people know Paradores. It's our main, our main uh, market in the UK. And many, many, many people in the UK, they know Paradores and they travel through Spain with their cars, uh, stopping in all Paradores they can. So um, we are creating a destiny. Uh, many times, in, as I said before, in the inland of, inland of Spain, don't think of uh, sun and beaches and, and big resorts. Think of hotels with 40 rooms uh, in places with a population than less than 5,000 people. Uh, so places where if there wasn't a parador, it wouldn't be a, a destination. That is what I want to, to I think that, that is a key issue when, when I want this is the map of uh, the Paradores in Spain, as you see. Uh, there are many in the inland. And um, this, this summer, for instance, uh, there was a big change in, in the behavior of, of the clients uh, because of the COVID. So normally in summer, people go to the, to the, to the, to the beaches, to, to the coast. This year in the inland, it was uh, really full of uh, all, all our hotels. So there was a change. People uh, were looking for for different destinations with less people uh, with, uh, with uh, in the in the nature areas and uh, so it was a different uh, behavior this this year okay? Th then uh, i will say something about covid but let me let me say that then covid is a prior priority now being safe but we are not going to change our goals uh, and our goal is to be a sustainable uh, company and that's why we made some uh, important things. From uh, last year, uh, we were one of the first hotel chains in the world to eliminate all single-use use plastics from our hotels. Our hotels. So there's nothing uh, single-use plastic in, in known of our hotels, and uh, that is really important. Also from last year, all the electricity consumed by our hotels comes from renewable uh, energy source. We collaborate in the care and preservation of natural species. Uh, and we collaborate with other institutions in, in beach cleaning, in plastic removal, and many actions just to, to, to be a sustainable company. And this year, we've, we, we have a new goal. And, and that is the, the last goal. I mean, it is the definite goal to be sustainable. And we are uh, going to make the final step and we have set ourselves the goal to be, uh, of becoming carbon neutral uh, in a short time. And that is going to be a, a big, uh, a great objective, and we are working on that. As I told you before, we are sustainable, not only in an in, in environmental uh, way, but also in the economic and the social way. Uh, as I told you before, we are a state-owned company, but we have profits every year. and. Uh, and we dedicate, we, we use those profits not only to create jobs, but also to, to keep our heritage. Every year we invest like 35, 36, 34 every year, million euros just in, in, in preserving and conservation of buildings. Uh, uh, and not only buildings, key buildings, but also um, the art, the, the we have a, a collection of more than 9,000 uh, uh, pieces of art in, in the whole of our chain. It, this is art from the 14th century up to now. I mean, so this is a, a, a very uh, social, sustainable uh, aim that we are uh, keeping. So, as I told you before, economically sustainable, socially sustainable, because we create quality jobs, more than 4,000 jobs every year. Uh, 
as I say, I always say, it is very easy to open a hotel in Mallorca or in Tenerife or in, uh, or in Benidorm. It is not that easy when you create this hotel in the inland, inland of Spain, in the rural world, in a small village, and we are creating jobs there, in, in this area. So that is really, really important. Um, and this year, just to finish, this year, I think we can, we can all agree this has been the worst uh, summer in the history of uh, tourism, uh, the hardest uh, summer in the history of tourism as we know it. Uh, let me give you just uh, two uh, figures. In July, I mean, I think we are one of the only companies in the world that has opened the 100% of their hotels. 100% were opened since uh, 25th uh, June. And in July, we had an occupation of uh, occupancy of uh, more than 70%. Uh, talking about August, it was more than 80%. Just think of, of that without any international client, with, uh, without nobody from the US or the UK or France. So we made it uh, alone. It was really, really tough. We, had, we worked really, really hard uh, in protocols just to be safe in front of COVID. And people think we are safe. And this is the figures. I mean, we have many comments in social networks and uh, talking about, about, about us saying Paradores is safe. It's a safe destination. But the, the best figure I can, I can give is this one. I mean, I don't, I don't think of any other hotel chain with 100% open, more than 70% in July, more than 80% in, in, in August uh, of occupancy rate. So that is uh, really unbelievable. Now, um, we are all waiting how not, uh, for the vaccine to put an end to this new normality we, we don't like. We, we want our old and, and boring normality. But uh, we are going to, to keep working hard just to be a safe destination. And just to finish, I can say that uh, soon uh, we will be 100 years old. And we will do it with more than 100 hotels uh, all around Spain. So creating decent jobs, preserving our history and heritage, promoting our products and our cuisine, boosting quality tourism and the economy of the most depopulated areas in, and taking care of our natural environment. So, and we are going to do it uh, by following the motto of, of Paradores, uh, quality, friendliness and legion. So thank you very much and I wait for your questions. Thank you very much, Oscar, for uh, for this uh, for this intervention. I, I would I would uh, underline three ideas. Uh, the first one could be easily deduced from your comments, although I don't think you employ that word. And the word would be experience. I think that Paradores uh, is very much focused on experience, on the possibility to touch the history, on the possibility to sleep in a castle in a monastery in which. Uh, a great uh, character from our history just uh, passed uh, or spent some, some time. So this is really, really important. The second idea would be that, that you have to contribute it to reshaping the image of Spain. The image of Spanish tourism is very much or was rather very much linked to, to, to sun, to the beach, to our islands. But you, you as Paradores have contributed to, 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 to expand that image and to show to our visitors that we are not only a country of beach and sun, but we are also a country full of history, full of splendid places, which are far from, from the seaside. And the third idea I would like to underline is that probably Paradores, and correct me if I'm wrong, was not born with the idea of becoming a profitable company, but it has become a profitable company. So this is the, 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 the beauty of, of the model of Paradores, the idea that there is social commitment, commitment to heritage preser preservation, commitment to environment, but there is also economic profitability on that business model. And uh, a company which has many similarities with, with, with Paradores in Scotland is, uh, is Cliff Hydro. And this is why I was particularly happy to, to, to see that Stephen Leakey was accompanying us today. Uh, it is a company which owns seven hotels in Scotland, 
all of them are just in beautiful uh, natural landscapes and they are very close to historic sites and to some extent it is also a, a, a great experience being in, in one of them. So uh, thank you Stephen for, be for, for being here and now I'm, I'm, I'm just shortly going through his, his CV. Stephen Leakey is chairman and chief executive of CRIF Hydro and the fifth generation of his, fam of his family to run uh, this hotel and estate since the doors opened on Scotland's maiden hydropathic establishment in 1868. The company is now the oldest trading registered company in Scotland. Uh, the family has expanded and Creef Hydro Limited now owns or manages seven hotels and um, Stephen is not only the chairman of Creef Hydro but he's also the chairman of the Scottish Tourism Alliance, uh, which is the voice of tourism in Scotland and the largest member organization for tourism businesses in Scotland and the leading representative body for its tourism industry. Stephen is a passionate uh, uh, and, and uh, committed to tourism in Scotland and has received a number of awards. Uh, for example, in November 2013, Stephen was presented with the Visit Scotland Scottish Thistle Award for his outstanding contribution to this industry. After being a Deputy Lieutenant for Perth and Kinross uh, since 2012, Stephen was appointed Lord Lieutenant in July 2019. So, um, uh, Stephen can, 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 can talk to us about the business model of his own company, but not only. He's also one of the most prominent voices for Scottish tourism. So in this double condition, in, with these double hats, Stephen, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ignacio. Very good. Let me just pull up the slideshow here. So I want to talk about three things, the Scottish Tourism Alliance, the Scottish Tourism Strategy, and a little bit about my own company. The Scottish Tourism Alliance been going for 10 years now, and the industry really had no voice before. So this is the first time the industry has had a meaningful voice in the country. We work with government and we persuade everyone in Scotland that we speak to that tourism is everybody's business. We have so many similarities with you in Spain, um, Oscar. There are some of the facts and figures. These, this presentation will go out after, so I won't read through all these things. The figures compared to Spain are small, but percentage-wise, they're still small, but significant in Scotland. Tourism matters more in Scotland than it does in England. Um, just because of the size of England, and so that is why it's so important that the Scottish Tourism Alliance has a powerful and large voice representing, you can see there, 250 trade associations. We think just over 70% of the industry uh, are feed in through the Tourism Alliance. That's important to us to have power to our elbow. So when we talk to government, they don't want to talk to 250 associations, they want to talk to just a few associations, the key leading, leading associations, and that, that seems to work well. We work well with, um, with natural products, Scotland Food and Drink. The Food and Drink strategy sits alongside the tourism strategy because we both work well together. We have a small team uh, in Scotland, um, but this small team does a power of work through the membership, through the council, through the different other trade associations that we work with. So making tourism everyone's business is so important to us. And then we have had since 2010 a tourism strategy. The first 10 years, we hoped to grow tourism by about one billion pounds a year. That seems to be working so far. And now we look forward to the next 10 years of the sustainable future. Now we talk in Scotland about sustainability meaning two things for us. It is about, but not simply, just a matter of improving the natural environment. I see Oscar in Spain, you do the same things. Um, uh, the sustainable economic use of our natural assets in Scotland. 
It also involves a sustainable approach to all economic development, including, including better ways of promoting and taking advantage of um, uh, potential areas such as renewable energy, as you do in Spain as well. Again, there are so many similarities between your trade and ours in our country. We work in partnership with all the government sectors and agencies that's important to us. The government understands, therefore, the private sector and what we think about and how we think. Well, Oscar, you mentioned your changing world. The figures are very similar here, perhaps worse so in Scotland. I don't know of any hotel company that, including my own, that have opened all our hotels. We still have hotels closed out the West Coast where the lack of international business um, is apparent. Our hotels out West Coast running 25% occupancy. And um, we're very envious of you, Oscar, running 70 and 80% occupancy. But the bigger hotels in rural areas are running better. The resort type hotels are running better. The city centre hotels are in very, very poor condition. Many are just simply closed. Most of, the, most of the visitor attractions in Scotland are also closed. And we cannot see any chance of reopening until the start of next season, which we think will be April. But again, even with that, we believe that we will only manage 50% of last year's figures for international business. We um, thought back in March that we would be a, a, a world leader with our uh, international business and tourism. Our first minister in Scotland launched our tourism strategy back in March. It was the 3rd of March that we launched this strategy. Um, little bit knew what was coming our way two or three weeks later on. We had an insight into it, but nobody knew just how much it would impact us. So we talk about the same sort of things as you talk about in Spain, about being passionate, about memorable experiences, about diverse businesses, and sustainability right at the very heart of everything we do. The green view of Scotland, green, clean cities and countryside in Scotland. So there's a bit about the tourism strategy. And then on to my own company. Well, there's the principal hotel. It is um, uh, 152 years old. Uh, Ignacio said the oldest trading registered company in Scotland and um, it is a thousand acres of estate. We can have 1,000 customers here. We had before lockdown 650 staff in this building. We had just over a thousand staff across the company. Now we have 700 staff after sadly redundancies just given the lack of business in particular groups and tours, conferences, exhibitions, weddings, events, banquets, Christmas party nights. And so that's the main Creef Hydro there. And Peebles Hydro, another hydropathic. We have our own water supply to these hydropathics, Greek word for water. I was a hall porter in 1983, the year I left school at this hotel. Never thinking 31 years later, we would own this hotel. We bought this in 2014. We've spent millions of pounds on it. All these old buildings, as many of you will testify, cost a lot of money to upkeep. Like you, Oscar, we reinvest virtually everything we make back into the fabric of our buildings and back into the people. Um, and that is part of the sustainability argument for us. We talk about our family hotels, our family of hotels, joining the family, being part of the family. It is our ambition to continue growing through management contracts, um, not just through purchasing. So, and then of course the generational element of the business. I'm fifth generation. I would describe myself as a professional commercial atelier and have been since working in this industry, this business since the age of 12. And then my father, my grandfather and ancestors before that. We have four children and um, all four children currently today are working in the business somewhere around and about. And that makes me very proud to think of that. But of course, working with a family business it does have its ups and downs, and we have to accept that not everyone will be happy all the time. Look at this picture. The guy at the back with his um, black suit on, this was to celebrate 140 years. I had to have a bit of a serious discussion with my family about them having to dress up. They talked about being bullied at school and having had to dress up in uh, Victorian outfits. I had to have this discussion. Look, we, um, we enjoy working in this company. There are many good things about working in this company. Sometimes you just have to do what the company needs you to do, including dressing up in Victorian outfits. So that young guy at the back, 
has now transferred into the Action Glen manager, and, um, and we have a great relationship despite his attitude 10 years ago. <laughs> Sustainability, green things, biomass boilers, electric strimmers, electric charge points, electric grass cutting machineries, electric bikes around the same as you, Oscar, with your business. We try where we can to maintain sustainability through going green where we can. It is more difficult in the older hotels, and um, most of our hotels are more than 100 years old, but we try where we can, double glazing and so on. Why are we investing? Well, we put everything back in, pretty much, Oscar, the same as your business. And why? Well, for these three reasons. People, planet, and profit. And the reason for our people is our pride in the people for training to make sure we offer decent service to everybody who comes here. We want our people, our staff, to enjoy their job. I enjoy my job. I want everyone else in this company to enjoy their job. And if we can make some profit, we're not shy about making profit. Last year, we made four million pounds profit. That's not enough. We need to make five million pounds profit so that can all be reinvested. So we are, we are then genuinely sustainable at four million pounds profit. It isn't enough. This year, we might lose six million pounds this year. This will take us 10 years to recover from, uh, from COVID-19. So good people, good revenue, into profit, and the profit goes back into the business through training staff, uniforms, looking after the fabric of our buildings, reinvesting back in. And then we try and do things a bit differently. And we make our own gin. We have the biggest privately owned distillery and gin school in any hotel in Britain that we know of. Um, so we, we, we consume a lot of gin and tonic in our hotels. And we are now retailing gin around and about the country four different types of gin, four different types of tonic, but the same water is used for the gin and tonic. So we're trying to diversify a bit, not just stay with the towels. And continuing on with the diversification, the outdoor activities, the weather, it's been mentioned by Ignacio and Oscar, the weather in Scotland is not quite as good as we'd like it to be some of the time, but when the weather is good, we can have a great time. So we try and consider things that families can do outdoor. This so far, we spent 300,000 pounds in this uh, just this year, it was due to open about the end of March, just as the whole country went into lockdown. That caused us some problem, but it's now open and working really very well. In fact, so well, we're going to roll this out in Peebles Hydro as well. That's the plan for that. And there's our young son who runs all, this was his idea. And um, so it's, it's great that it's one of his first ideas has been so far a success and we're rolling that out. So there we go, there's our family business. And there's the final slide. stop sharing now. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. And thank you, um, Oscar, as well. Um, sorry, uh, Ignacio, I don't know if you wanted to say a few words, or, or if not, we can begin with the, the Q&A part of the session. Let's go to the Q&A. So yeah, have OK. Time. Uh, brilliant. OK. Um, so yeah, everybody who's connected, um, please, uh, you can write in now uh, with your questions that you have. Uh, as a reminder, as I said at the beginning, you can do that via the chat function at the bottom there or the Q&A function. Uh, just write them in and then I will read out uh, your questions to whichever the of the of either Oscar or Stephen or both, uh, which whatever you would like. Um, OK, brilliant. Let's see. OK, uh, so first question, Oscar, this is a question for you. Um, do you think that the Paradoria's business model could be exported to other countries? And if so, would there be any prerequisites such as uh, governmental ownership of the, of the company? Well, actually, there was some, some, some experiences. Uh, maybe some of you know this one in, in Portugal. It was called uh, Pousadas. It was uh, the same idea, the Paradores. Finally, they didn't success, and now it is not a, a state-owned company, but it's a private one. You know, in Spanish, we say private and public. Public is state-owned, really. So the thing is, uh, now this Portugal chain, it, 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 uh, it is existing now, but it's not a state-owned company. It was sold. And um, we receive every year many, many petitions from different countries just to explain and I know that some countries are trying to, to do such a thing. I mean, now we, we've seen this experience in Scotland. It's brilliant, Stephen. Uh, uh, really, congratulations. I love what you do. And, uh, and I hope many, many, many people will do such a thing because Stephen 
they are investing in, in Scottish heritage and, and it's doing uh, from, the, from the private uh, sector. Uh, well, that is not that common. And, and, and I think uh, uh, many countries could do such a, such a thing as Paradores. I mean, Paradores uh, uh, works with the, with the incomes uh, from the clients. And we use some of that incomes just to preserve Spanish her heritage or to keep our local food or to keep uh, our art. That, is, that comes from the, from the private sector, as I, I want to, I, I mean, what I mean is all those euros are not from public budget. They come from, from clients and they are used to a public, uh, to a public uh, use uh, just to, to preserve our heritage. So I think it, it's a good idea. I mean, not only uh, promoting tourism, just think of tourism. Stephen is, is talking about a company with uh, two, two centuries, three centuries. I mean, uh, here in Spain, when you think of Spain, you think of a beach with big hotels, with towers and, and in the beach, in Mallorca and Tenerife and Canary Islands. But when Paradores was created in 1928, there was no tourism in Spain. I mean, <laughs> and, and that was not only useful uh, to promote tourism in Spain, but also to keep our, our heritage. I didn't say it before. Spain is the third country in the world, just superated by China and Italy. According to UNESCO, we are the third uh, country in the world with world heritage. So that, it is not that easy to, to, to preserve all that. So experience like Paradores, I think, is useful. In many countries, in South America, in the rest of Europe, even in the north of Africa, they come every year and they ask, uh, they ask us how to do it. Okay, uh, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar. Uh, Stephen, uh, we've had a question for you. Um, could you please elaborate further on how the Scottish Tourism Alliance works and um, what are the channels to for people to express their views to the Scottish Government and, the, the pub and public opinion? So the, the Tourism Alliance Board is made up of 10 or 12 directors. Um, for example, the chief executive of Edinburgh Airport, the chief executive of one of the larger tour companies in Scotland, um, the, the, the chief executive of the Scottish Retail Consortium, the Food and Drink um, um, Association in Scotland. So that's the board. And then we have a council. The council is made up of 35 different, different associations. So they meet once every two months. And we find out through the associations, through the, the sub-associations, we find out from them what's going on. And that's a really useful ear for us to find out on the ground what's going on, how's business. What are their pressures and hassles? And that allows us, the chief executive and I, to feed back to the government and Scottish enterprise, the public sector agencies, allows us to feed back in real time virtually uh, with what's going on around Scotland. And then we work with London, UK hospitality, um, and Westminster links, um, Europe and, and the, kind of the various minimum wage stuff, the stuff in Scotland that's not devolved, VAT, for example, um, is not devolved, so that's for Westminster to figure out our VAT in Scotland. So the reduction, for example, in VAT from 20% to 5%, VAT in Scotland was the second highest in Europe for accommodation. Now at 5%, that's much more like it. That was very welcome to have that massive reduction down to 5%. And that's come through Westminster, but also pressure from Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government. Air passenger duty is the highest in the world in Scotland. Nobody else, nowhere else in the world would you pay £13 each way to travel from Edinburgh to London, for example. That affects us adversely. Scotland is, is an expensive destination. So we can help by feeding from the Council and the Scottish Tourism Alliance Board back to government in Scotland and England to say, look, please consider a reduction in their passenger duty alongside the reduction in VAT, and that will help get the important business of tourism back on the road again. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. We've, we've had a question from um, Monica. This is for you again, Oscar. Um, how can Paradores know that their green energy supply comes from green energy? Um, can you tell us a bit about your energy supplier, perhaps, for the hotels? Well, actually, as I, as I said before, all the electricity is coming. It's 100% from renewable source. That is warranted by our contract with the company that provides uh, the electricity to us. Huh? Then we are 
we are nowadays with the COVID, everything is going to change because we, we all have to cut some budgets. Huh? But we were working and we will work again when, when normality comes to us. We are working in, in, in many projects in different parados just to make them um, that all energy, not only electricity, uh, electrical en energy, but all the energy in the parador will be sustainable and coming from renewable uh, source. So we are working on that. It's going to be some million euros. Uh, as I said before, now this year it's a strange year and uh, we are hoping to, to go back to normality as soon as possible and, and get back to these projects to make every parador, as I said before, carbon neutral. I mean, so that, that is the main aim. That is not going to be easy. It is not going to be uh, cheap, but we are going to be carbon neutral again. Great, thank you, Oscar. Um, thank you, we're, we're receiving a lot of questions indeed. So thank you everybody who's um, for all of the questions. Uh, okay, this is a question um, from Pablo, which is also for you, Oscar. Uh, Pablo asks, um, is there any plan to sell out Paradoris or to, to privatize it? Um, and how, uh, how would you kind of utilize that knowledge? Uh, was there a plan to work with the Omani government on developing a similar concept there? Not at all. I mean, there's an, an old debate in Spain about that. Uh, finally, we don't have so many companies, state-owned companies, uh, with profit. Huh? So, so I mean, I think this this is a good model. Um, if it were, uh, I think, huh, I'm, I'm, that that this is an opinion. Um, we, I, as I told you before, we have 97 hotels in Spain. Uh, many of them wouldn't be opened if it wasn't uh, a state-owned company. I don't know if, if you understand what I mean, but it is really, really easy to, to run a hotel in Santiago de Compostela in front of the cathedral where a million of people go every year just uh, to do the, uh, the way of Santiago, of uh, St. James. Yeah? Uh, it is easy to have an hotel there. It is not that easy to have an hotel in a place of uh, 2,000 people uh, in the inland of Spain. And I always like to say, uh, let, me, let me give you one example. There's a small village in Spain called Sigüenza, in the inland of Spain, just near Madrid. It's a 150 kilometers from Madrid. In this village, uh, now, there are two restaurants with uh, Michelin stars. That, wouldn't, uh, that, that will never happen if there wasn't a parador there. As we have a castle there, a parador, uh, with uh, 25,000 people coming uh, to this village every year just because of the parador. When they go there, they sleep at the parador. They eat one day at the parador, but the other day, they are going to eat in a restaurant in a local place. They buy in this local place and they uh, get some products from this local place. And now they know the wine and the cheese and, and things that they are going to buy. So, I mean, uh, it is not that easy to, to do such a thing uh, in so many places uh, without, the, without the support of the government behind. I don't know if, if, you, if you understand what I mean. No, yeah, that, that makes sense. Thanks, Oscar. Um, okay, we've now got a question for, for, both, uh, for both of you, uh, Stephen and Oscar. This is from um, Elenia from Melia Whitehouse. So Melia Hotels International, obviously a very, very big Spanish hotel chain as well. Um, an international one and they're also patron members of the chamber. Uh, so Elenia has asked, um, as both companies seem to be committed to sustainability, uh, how are you planning to balance safety protocols and sustainability, uh, continuing to reduce single-use plastics and guest experience? Uh, Stephen, perhaps if you'd like to um, begin with answering that one. I think um, with all these uh, things, is a constant drip feed. I think Oscar mentioned this as well, it's the balance of commerciality, making profits reinvest back in versus sustainability, green environmental things. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so, so some things are, are not kind of commercially viable and going green. They cost more money. It costs more money. So it's balancing that aspect, the green aspect with social responsibility, corporate responsibility versus making money to reinvest back into, as I said before in the, in the chat, um, back into the people and our businesses. As a matter of fact, there's no debate be between being sustainable or not. 
you must be sustainable. I mean, tourism must be sustainable or there will be so, uh, tourism in the future. So, and people are asking more and more about uh, a sustainable product. Uh, you, you have to offer, you have to show you are, you are sustainable. So, so I think there's no, there's no debate and there's no incompatibility between, between both of them. And, uh, and uh, that was a good question because we've, we've been working really, really hard with COVID just to, just to, not, just to not go back in, in, our, in our battle our, about, against plastics, for instance. Uh, now you have to, you, you have to, uh, to, you must have these uh, small bottles with, uh, with things uh, to wash hands and uh, masks everywhere and, and things in the hotels. And we've made a really big effort just to not use plastic, not to go back in this fight against plastic. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, this is a question from, from Claire, which I'm, I suppose is probably for, for both of you as well. Uh, beyond the value of investment in your heritage, what other measures to success do you use to measure the protection of culture within, within your establishments? Well, some of you said before that uh, uh, we, we, I mean, in both cases, we are promoting a tourism based on uh, culture, history, art, so that is one of the main aims of our, our both companies. I mean, Paradores invests every year, as I said before, more than 35 million euros every year just in keeping art and history and buildings, not only buildings, also pictures and uh, sculptures and, and art, Spanish art. We have uh, one Picasso picture. We have, uh, like, as I said before, 9,000 pieces of art all around Spain. So. That is one of the aims of the company. And for us, um, I think if, if, the, if the president or chief executive or the family or the chairman set the pace, the poise, the style of the company, then that's so important that we, we keep hold of the history, the heritage, the culture. So for example, in Scotland, being fiercely proud of everything we do in Scotland, playing the bagpipes, tartan, tweed, whiskey, Haggis, all the things that Scotland stands for, the green stuff, the hills, the mountains, the valleys, Glencoe. Um, so in some respects, a bit like the environment and the sustainability side of the environment, it may not be terribly commercial, but for me, it's more important to be proud of everything you do rather than just make money off it. And if we can make money, then we'll put it back in again. And that goes back to the heritage, the ethos, the ethos of the company. And that has to start from, from the desks of folk like Oscar and me, if we don't do it, how can we expect other folk to do it? So there's a bit of responsibility for us at the head of our organizations to, I think, consider the wider impact of our business on our environment and for our country. Great. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, um, another question that um, I think hasn't been touched on as much as uh, perhaps you would have expected. Uh, what, what uh, for both uh, both of you as well? Uh, what impact do you envisage uh, Brexit? To, well, what does it currently have on your businesses, and what kind of impact do you expect it to continue to have, particularly um, post uh, two thousand twenty? Let's go. Um... So this year, our company, um, we, we, we were, last year was the best every year. This year was going to be even better than last year. We were due to turn over 40, 40 million pounds this year with over a thousand staff. We were looking forward to just a, a great year. We were looking forward to making four million pounds, to make five million pounds, uh, to keep going, keep expanding, buy more hotels, manage more hotels, keep selling gin, extend all our products. And that whole, that whole world for most of us in this room fell apart. This year now we're going to turn over, we thought in April we'd turn over 10 million pounds, so we're going to drop from 40 million pounds turnover to 10 million pounds turnover. It's a bit better, we reopened largely in July, mid-July, halfway through our season. We might turn over 15 million pounds this year. We thought we we're going to lose 6 million. We might lose, we might lose half that now maybe, we will still lose money. Our challenge now is at the end of season, We've had a good season and we're doing really well compared to many hoteliers in Scotland who have been reliant on city centre trade, international trade and groups and tours. 
conferences, weddings, events, banquets, and so on. We're fortunate that we don't have a reliance on that. Our figures are similar. 65% uh, of our trade comes from Scotland. 35% of our trade comes from the rest of the world. It's very, sim very similar to Spain. So our challenge is over the next eight months until next season starts in April, assuming there's a vaccine come out and there's some sort of safety and no further significant country lockdown, our challenge is most hotels in this sector in Scotland will lose money between now and April next year. We can cope with that. We planned for that. Our challenge is what happens if next season doesn't take off? What happens if vaccine, an effective vaccine, doesn't come out, materialize? What happens if consumer confidence is still low and folk just aren't prepared to travel? So for domestic tourism in Scotland, 65% of our trade, that's fine. But that's not enough to rely on to make money next year. And if we don't make profit next year, we can't reinvest, we can't employ people, we can't pay tax, and the whole pack of cards starts to fall apart. And that's the challenge. I said in my chat that I think it will be 10 years to recover from this. 10 years of paying back the extra unwanted debt that companies like us and many others in Scotland have had to take on. We've had very good government support. We're simply looking for further and more government support. If we don't, many companies will fail. Well, Stephen is right. Uh, it's the same here. I mean, last year it was one of the best years in the history of Paradores. And this year is going to be, it's going to be a disaster. Even with the numbers I, I gave you before. In July, we had more than 70% of occupancy and almost more than 80%. Stephen knows the importance of the, of the figures I'm giving right now. But I can tell you that even with that, Paradores is going to have a half of the incomes of last year. But if we talk about the, the whole world, I mean, the tourism uh, growth uh, in last year, it was 4%, uh, 4%. This year, tourism is going to go down 56% uh, in the whole world. Just in America, uh, 47, in Europe, 58, in Africa, uh, 47, in Middle West, uh, 52, in, in Asia, uh, 60%. This, uh, this is uh, the worst year in the history of tourism, as I said before. Tourism is the only industry that has been growing and growing and growing in the last 40, 50 years. Growing and growing and growing every year. And this year, uh, as, as you said before, numbers are really, really bad in the whole world. And the main question is that what Stephen said, what is going to happen to the next, uh, <laughs> before, before Eastern? That is the main, the main, the main question right now. Huh? Yeah, thank you both. Makes a lot of sense. Um, a question that Pablo has asked, which um, I think is very it, well, it fits in very well with what you've just talked about, and you've kind of a bit touched on it already. He says, uh, "Tourism as it stands now is based on numbers and volume, of course. So, um, obviously, you've had coronavirus to think of, but how how is kind of sustainability and your goals with that compatible with uh, the ever increasing numbers, or also your targets for?" numbers of um, people through your hotels? Well, when you have uh, hotels with uh, 40 or 50 uh, rooms, I mean, you, you have a model. And when you are uh, just uh, thinking of culture, of uh, gastronomy, local gastronomy, there is a model. I mean, we're not talking about uh, a huge resort for 2,000 people in the beach. Uh, just consuming with everything paid before, just consuming uh, alcohol or whatever, but thinking of uh, other kind of tourism. And uh, as I said before, there's no debate. Uh, tourism must be sustainable or there won't be uh, uh, so, uh, tourism. So we have uh, this model and we are going to keep promoting it. I mean, uh, of course, we need different kinds of tourism, uh, of course. But uh, I'm talking about Paradores, and this is the tourism we're promoting. It's a quality tourism. It's a tourism, a responsible tourism. And you need to be sustainable, but not only from the environmental uh, point of view, also the economic and social one. Because if not, it is not going to be possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and Oscar is using very similar words, the words that I would have chosen to use, the, the balance of culture, the sustainability argument um, of the green environmental side versus the commercial side of sustainability. We all want to 
make sure our companies exist in two years' time, five years' time, 150 years' time from, uh, for us. And you have to balance that with the, with the whole Brexit scenario, which we've, it's certainly in Scotland, forgotten about since March the 19th this year. We have to now turn our minds to what's the likely outcome and how is that going to affect tourism in Scotland. And in that respect, the Scottish Tourism Alliance works with government. We're looking at a scenario planning exercise with some of the key industry players with how Brexit and the political environment, the worldwide political environment, uh, might look and affect this industry over the next three to five years. So that, that project's going on right now. Fair enough. Um, great, okay. Uh, another question that we've had, which is from Cecilio. Um, this is kind of a nice kind of summarising question uh, for, for both of you as well. Uh, what would you say is the best way for companies in the UK, Scotland and Spain, uh, well, UK and then also more specifically Scotland and Spain, uh, to support this the sustainable tourism initiative generally? So I kind of guess the main takeaways of what you've, um, the models of both of your hotel chains. Well, actually, we are fully committed with the uh, with uh, with agenda, with the 2030 agenda, and we work with uh, with uh, with the office, the official office, for the implementation of the agenda in Spain. I mean, you know, this is a program by United Nations. There are some goals, specific goals, and we are going to reach uh, any any one of them. I mean, so we are following this agenda, and we we have a uh, a part of the company is dedicated to that just to fulfill all the uh, all the aims in this uh, 27 i think in this 27 uh, global development uh, uh, sustainable goals scotland from a national perspective government perspective um, we've invested a lot in wind wind power wind generation in wave power and wave generation um, so we're trying very hard to be a green energy um, country in scotland from a, from a company perspective, um, as I said before, um, we try where we can to have green environmental products around and about. And that goes for most of the companies that I speak to. Um, this Scottish Tourism Alliance has a similar sort of agenda. The challenge in Scotland is this, to get around Scotland, Glencoe, Balahulish, Sky, up north, whilst the trains run, um, they're not electric trains around and about, um, most folk have to travel by groups, tours, coaches, buses, or by road. So, um, so, so green energy, electric cars we have, for example, in all our hotels, green um, in, uh, vehicle electric charge points. But for example, I don't have an electric car. And the reason is because um, West Coast hotels are 80 miles west, Peebles Hydro is 80 miles south, and an electric car won't take me there and back in one day. And I can't assume that the charge points will be available to recharge the car when I get there. So our infrastructure for charge points is a challenge around Scotland. But, um, but it, it will take some time to get there. But we're, we're, we're kind of, I would say genuinely the country and most companies are genuinely committed to going environmentally more sustainable. That's great. Good to hear. Um, okay, uh, a final question that we've had, uh, again, for both of you. Um, in terms of sustainability, um, so obviously the, the theme of this event, uh, what, what, what do you do in terms of training and education uh, for your own staff within both of your hotel chains? Of course, we, we have all these, um, I mean, as I said before, we have uh, 4,500 employees and uh, we have a, a department just dedicated to, to continuing I mean, the formation of, of all of them. And of course, there's a program just to, to inform about all these goals by the United Nations. I mean, all our employees, they know these goals and, and they know our projects and our programs to fulfill all these goals. So uh, we are fully committed to them. As uh, Stephen said before, we are, some of, some of, some of the uh, programs are easier than other ones. I mean, for instance, he was talking about electric charges in, in hotels. We are also working on that. That is not one of the, of the easiest ones, but we are working on, on it. And some hotels have, have these charges right now. But when you see the goals by, by United Nations, they are not only uh, environmental goals, but also social goals. I mean, uh, having, for instance, uh, uh, quality jobs, that is one of the goals. 
promoting local development. That is one of the goals, and, and I think that's a key issue. Talking about Scotland and the inland of Spain, uh, if you think of the rural areas, creating jobs there, that is really important uh, because we have a, a problem with uh, population living in rural areas. So that is the same in Scotland and even in the inland of Spain. So keeping people in, 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 in the in, in rural areas is really a social aim and it's in the in this uh, United Nations program. I mean, all our employees know them. Uh, we have uh, many campaigns explaining them, how we are trying to to fulfill them. And, uh, and of course, that's a main goal for us. Just to add to what Oscar said, I would say three things. One of them is I'm the picking up of litter. I promised myself 25 years ago when I first became chief executive of this company, I'd never walk past a piece of litter without picking it up. And I still remind myself today, I will not do that. So the request to all of our staff is please pick litter up. Don't just expect the gardeners to do it. And if everyone in the country does that, we'll look much cleaner and greener. That's the first thing, picking litter up. Don't walk past it. If you walk past it, you set yourself a new lower standard. Beautiful. The second point is the use of single-use plastics and the like. So the difference the staff or people can make is please consider all the plastics that we use, that we still use, the bottles and so on, please consider, do you have to give that away or can, is there a better, greener way to, to use it or give it away? And the third point, and this is the biggest thing for me with kitchens especially, turn it off. Turn the heating off, the power off, the air conditioning, Turn the tap off, don't leave taps running, don't leave lights on in bedrooms, please. Don't leave your staff accommodation heating or lights on. Turn it off. There we go. There's the three messages from us. <laughs> yeah, I think they're great. They're kind of they're great, those are great takeaways, not only for you know with for, for everyone, aren't they? More generally speaking. Um, great. Well, thank you so much, Stephen and Oscar. Those are all of the um, the questions that we had. Um, it's been a really, really insightful session this morning. Um, I've certainly, certainly been, I've certainly learned a lot. Um, it's been a lot of good perspective. Uh, um, Ignathi, I don't know if you wanted to say a few words to wrap up. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, well, I have to thank both panelists for 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 at least two things. The first one would be not talking too much about COVID. And you know, we our current situation is very much absorbed by the COVID crisis, but but the COVID should not overshadow good models, good business models as the ones you represent. So let's hope that we can uh, together uh, head towards this uh, normality uh, as soon as possible, and these these good tourist models you represent can can shine again. And the second thing is that we, you have contributed with your own, uh, your own words, your own presentations, to open a window. And we are, I mean, the, the Spanish Chamber of Commerce in London, the consulate in Edinburgh are here for that, to, to open windows uh, in, which, uh, in the sectors in which we detect that there is room for further interaction. We do not believe that models can be exported. I mean, there are many, many particular, you know, uh, characteristics in, in every different country, in every different region. But at least we, we can all learn from success stories. And you represent a success story in terms of tourism because you have contributed uh, to, to preserve environment, to respect history and 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 to sell the own personality of every 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 country every every uh, village in in Spain so uh, so this is something uh, really interesting for us and now we will keep exploring a little bit the landscape we can see through through that window you have contributed to to open so thank you very much for that and back to you the floor Hannah, thank you very oh. much. <laughs> thank you. No, um, yeah, thanks, Ignatia. Um, I just wanted to say as well that after this session, um, to everyone who registered, I will be circulating uh, the link of the recording of this session, which will be on our YouTube channel. So if you have any colleagues or contacts that you think it could be of interest to, you can share the video with them uh, so that they can watch this session at a later point. Um, but yeah, thank you very much again, Oscar and Stephen and Ignatia for your help as well. And uh, yeah, we'll um, see you again. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.